Great. Okay. So I think uh, we've heard a little bit uh, from this session and from other sessions that um, maybe there, it would be good to go through a little bit of background because like we talked a little bit um, about how this session is regarding, um, you know, talking about a little bit of the um, GPL enforcement or litigation that's going on. Um, and so I just wanted to spend a few minutes just saying like, well, what, what, why, why are we doing that? Like, what's, what's the point? Um, so, uh, so yeah, I mean, the, the great thing about the software that people are creating that, uh, that they're putting under copyleft licenses is that they're all intending for other people to be able to build, uh, build on that and, and modify it and reuse it. Um, and do need things with it. Uh, basically, uh, for you to be able to have your devices help you to do the things you want them to do. Um, and so I think that's uh, a really important thing to remember is that that's kind of where where this is coming from and, and what we're trying to do with this. Um, because, uh, because yeah, it, it's about the original authors um, and, and what they're, they're, the freedom they're trying to give to people. Um, and so, uh, so I'm just thinking, you know, back to things like OpenWRT and other projects like that uh, that are quite popular and that are giving people um, the, the right to do these helpful things on their devices. Um, and so uh, the, the problem being that sometimes, you know, companies use this code, you know, they have decided they are going to use this code because it is uh, helpful to them to, um, to make a product, which is totally fine, of course. Um, as long as you comply with the license. And so uh, I think we thought initially, um, like the, the movement per se, back in the day that these things would be followed kind of somewhat automatically. Um, and I think we found over time that, um, that some companies have kind of dug in and said, well, uh, we don't really want to follow it. And, you know, um, for, for whatever reasons. Um, and then so we, we talk to them and we say, hey, um, uh, I, I notice people are not getting the freedoms that the authors in, encoded into the license that they used when they wrote the software. Um, could, could you fix that? And so um, oftentimes uh, the companies say no, and then we ask them a bit more, give them a lot of time, and then they say no. And so uh, I just, just wanted to kind of clarify that what we're trying to do is get these rights that the, the companies chose when they used the software um, they, they knew they had to give those rights to you and they're just saying, no, uh, we're not going to give those to you. And that, that's why we get into these situations where we have to do enforcement and litigation. So it's not something we want to do, uh, that we want to have to do, but, but anyway, um, that's kind of the background I wanted is we're trying to get this freedom and this is a thing we have to do sometimes. Hi, we're the compliant, most of the compliance team at Software Freedom Conservancy. Um, I'm Karen Sandler, I'm the Executive Director of Software Freedom Conservancy, and I really care about software freedom because, uh, for a lot of reasons, but I have a heart condition and I have a pacemaker defibrillator that's in, planted in my body and I can't see the source code of my body, and worse still, it's only inappropriately shocked me and I don't have any ability to review or change the code and I, have, I can't hire a medical professional who can help me with that. So that very real reason is why I care about software freedom. And so we work together at Software Freedom Conservancy. Do you want to like introduce yeah, yourself? Sure. So, um, so I'm Bradley Kuhn. Uh, I've worked on uh, primarily copyleft related uh, things in open source and free software since 1997. Um, and the thing I think I want to add to what uh, Denver's uh, uh, really important introductory remarks uh, to give a little bit of the history of that from a long time ago. So there were basically two schools of thought when open source and free software got started. One school said, well, we would really like to have the source code to everything, the ability to hack on it ourselves, ability to update it on our devices, um, but we don't want to really demand that. We want to just ask nicely, and if people don't give it to us, we'll just figure out what we'll do that way. And that's the world of non-copyleft licenses, things like the BSD license. They asked nicely, please give us the source code and the right to reinstall, the right to modify the software. And if the company that's incorporated that software into there says no, then there's no recourse. Copyleft licensing is the alternative to that. It has legal requirements that demand that the end user get certain rights. Uh, and that's the kind of stuff that Denver was talking about, where we've reached a moment in history where for-profit companies uh, unfortunately believe their rights are more important than the rights of individuals and have been pretty successful at 
getting more rights even in copyleft software than individuals have. So one of the center things that we do is focus on products um, out there in the world that have GPL software, often Linux, I want to test that out. Linux yeah, that, software you know, in them, the and attempt to make sure the user who buys that device has all the rights that uh, GPL was supposed you know, to have. industry or uh, but also from other kind of social, having some sort of social yeah, I just wanted to add social. one thing to that uh, as well. And, and, and part of this, too, is to promote people to be able to make businesses and, and other sort of organizations see, around, kind of uh, around all of this boss that we have. Uh, because right now, basically, a lot of a lot of markets, industries are prevented from existing at all because uh, people don't have access to the complete corresponding source. Uh, so there's lots of companies that could exist to make new features um, to all of these devices that we're using, but they can't because of the rampant GPL violations that exist today. Um, and so that's one of the, the big issues that we're seeing and one of the things that benefits everyone um, uh, when we resolve these issues, um, even if you don't necessarily do software development. So, so that's why I, mean, um, and I think that's good. Are that's are that's, that's maybe hidden a bit from you a lot is, is all of the other things that would exist. Because Lance keeps saying he's not going to help. We all agree that Oregon State actually should be on there. Um, but this is the group, uh, one of the, you know, the initial cohort of offices. Actually, the initial cohort of offices. We're insiders who know a lot of the stuff. John's not in. Enjoyable to watch McCoy and I get this. CMU and a very specific issue. Uh, really uh, and, uh, exactly. uh, okay, I, oh, I, uh, I just learned what copy left was last week. Those were the ones that were. Kind of <laughs> Can you give me some intro material? So that was the material we're trying uh, to give you there. It uh, might help. Um, Does anybody have any questions uh, about bigger, sort of basics? And don't be afraid to ask them because uh, we realize uh, this con uh, we're excited. This conference so this brought so many new companies, and we don't want to turn this quickly turn into a very, very detailed discussion. We already heard questions at the beginning. Uh, Sloan funded a few extras that I know and that I interact with most of the audience here. So, the, okay, go ahead. So the the so the question is about the, the question of of whether or not you distribute software to somebody, when 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 does various requirements to give users rights to copy, modify, and redistribute the software uh, engage? Um, the traditional uh, group of GPL licenses, uh, GPL and LGPL, uh, indeed tied that to the moment of distribution. And so in those cases, if you don't distribute a copy uh, to someone, they don't have a right to demand complete corresponding source code. Uh, the Afero GPL, uh, the AGPL, is a variant of the GPL that has a requirement of that nature, that every user of the network service has a right to ask for complete corresponding source code. Yeah. Uh, yeah because, you, because you're insisting on making the, a question that was a simple question into one that is a high expert. Con okay, so I'll ask the... Uh, you, uh, okay, I'll answer the expert version. The expert version is a lot of people don't realize when you deploy a website, there is a number of things that are distributed uh, to the user. JavaScript is a great example. Most people don't realize when they use the web all day long, they're actually downloading and installing software in the computer all day long. I, I can't believe people do this. I browse without JavaScript turned on because you're just basically saying, hey, anybody on the internet want to install some software on my computer and run it and see what happens? That's what you're doing when you're browsing the web without JavaScript uh, turned, uh, you know, some sort of plugin that turns off JavaScript. Um, and in those cases, it's the implications of the AGPL and the GPL are exactly the same. Distribution is happening. So if you have GPL JavaScript, it's exactly the same as if it was a Faro GPL JavaScript. No, you should have it. Okay. So there's your expert, the expert question answer. Do we have any more non-expert questions? <laughs> Uh, so I think the short answer is no. There's no simple solution. Uh, I think the longer answer is that uh, we're trying to promote uh, people making things that are easier to use uh, without uh, different uh, anti-features. Um, but in the meantime, yeah, depending on your situation and your use case um, and, you know, your friend group and all of those sorts of things, um, it, it you, you may still find it necessary to use some of these anti features uh, for a while and you know we're very uh, uh, sensitive and sympathetic to that 
Right. So, so that's right. The question, just to confirm, the question uh, was about um, a, a very high percentage of of websites don't work properly or at all if you disable JavaScript. Um, and so, um, uh, generally, I'm, I'm saying uh, yes. I, I agree that is the case. A lot of things will not work if you don't enable JavaScript or other non-free software. And we're uh, uh, sympathetic to that being a, a current issue, uh, and we're really trying to make things better um, while understanding in the meantime that a lot of people, you know, fully FOSS cold turkey, so to speak. And so I think it's very important to make that transition um, uh, a smooth one. Yeah, I, I mean, to say go cold turkey, it's impossible to live in the world and not use some proprietary JavaScript. I, I find unless you have an assistant or some family member who's going to do a lot of the practical things for you. Um, but out of curiosity, raise your hand if you try to avoid JavaScript when you use the web or proprietary JavaScript in particular. It's like a quarter of the room. That's pretty high. Yeah. Although most of the JavaScript is not GPL, I'm probably off topic for this yeah. <laughs> for this session. Yeah. Yeah, any more questions about the generalities of GPL and enforcement. enforcement, why it's enforced, why it exists? I just want, want to make sure we really get questions covered that were in the last session that people were afraid to ask because they were, they were basic questions. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I once, I, I, I'm going to quote something I said once because it's been quoted uh, by, by political opponents back into my face so many times. I said, I once said that an unenforced GPL is effectively the BSD license. Um, someone actually used that quote to say that I was agreeing, get this, um, this person argued that I was agreeing that if a GP, GPL wasn't enforced, it was no longer enforceable because I said that. Um, this is the w political world I live in, um, but um, <laughs> uh, they, they, they will do any trick they can find to try to trap you uh, from fighting for user freedom. But uh, I, think, I think it is it's still the case that there's really no observable difference in the world if no one enforces the copyleft licenses that might as well not have been copylefted because th these companies do not care about their users' rights. And it's a very, very sad situation. Uh, not only does the violation continue, but things get much worse over time. The violations become worse. Um, and it becomes harder to fix violations. Yeah. Uh, another basic question, what's the difference between like copyright and software licensing, I think, in, in terms of what you can require of users or distributors of software? You want me to take that or you want to take care? I, I guess I didn't say in my introduction that uh, I'm a lawyer turned executive director, um, but I'm not your lawyer and this is not legal advice and all <laughs> the, the, um, the, the different uh, disclaimers that you would say. And so uh, copyright um, arises when a work of creative expression is fixed in a tangible medium. So that means like when you have a creative like expression, and so uh, in some ways you know a, a song or a, a, a you're uh, you know writing a, a novel or any of the things that the music any anything that um, that copyright covers in software, the copyright um, occurs at the moment that you fix it. And it's uh, that you you write it down or you record it or it's um, uh, it becomes uh, concrete in, a, in, um, uh, in whatever tangible medium is relevant for that expression. And so uh, copyright licenses take those copyrights, which are a, a, they call them a, a, often a bundle of rights. And so they take those rights and um, and you explain which w under what circumstances um, the recipient of the license can. Um, uh, can use those rights, and so the um, you know whether they can um, can uh, publish it, can copy it, can um, can make derivative works, right? All of that those are exclusive rights of the copyright holder, and so the license basically um, is the 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 form in which you um, you grant those rights and allow people to use those um, uh, you know, do those things with those copyrights, um, and uh, you. Um, in that license, you can put um, terms that are not necessarily those exclusive copyrights. So, um, in a in a software license, um, you know, you you um, iterate whatever terms that you will grant permission to those copyrights, but they can be um, more expensive. I don't know if I'm giving too legalese, but just. Yeah, I thought you were going to do a non-legal. 
Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah okay. sure. I'm, I'm sorry. I went into legal mode. And... Yeah. yeah, so I'm not a lawyer, so obviously <laughs> I can't give you legal advice. Um, so, uh, um, uh, and I can't be a lawyer because I'm not a lawyer. Um, so, so the, 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 but one of the things I've, I've realized in dealing with this stuff is, is, it, is computer geeks have a, um, a rather intuitive, a, a good intuitive understanding of how these things work. Uh, and, and so you can apply a lot of the things you know about software and, and how software works to, to these kinds of things. Uh, as Karen was saying, the, the, the licenses are initially an, issued by a copyright holder to someone they distribute to, and then they form an agreement. Uh, that agreement is the license, uh, and the, the interesting thing about how these licenses work is the only way you can get permission uh, to form that agreement is by accepting the license, because if you don't accept the license by default, as Karen was saying, these bundle of rights that copyrights control, uh, you can't exercise them. You can't, co you can't reproduce the work, you can't modify the work, you can't redistribute the work, et cetera. Uh, and so what this transitions well into what's going on in our Visio case, because there is an agreement form between the copyright holder and the person they distribute the software to, um, that in a legal sense, I'm not a lawyer, but as I understand it from lawyers, is, is called a contract. You form a contract, an agreement between those parties. In our Visio case, uh, we, for the first time, brought forward an action, not as a copyright holder, in the works that appeared in the Visio televisions that were in violating the GPL, but instead, we brought it forward as a third-party beneficiary of that agreement between the copyright holder and the uh, and, and, and Vizio. Yeah, a third-party beneficiary right is something that's um, a very established idea in um, in contract law. And the idea is that if a contract gives a right to somebody who's not of the initial two parties of the contract, so you know, a, a, a <laughs> uh, somebody, uh, you know, when when two parties um, may uh, agree to something, when you you know, if you're um, the copyright holder and you're giving a license and then the, um, the person accepting that license are the two parties of the contract. But the contract can say, but I actually want, to, I, I have a license with um, an agreement with Bradley over here. I'm giving him license, uh, uh, giving him all these rights. But if in the contract we say, actually, we also want uh, Denver to be able to have some rights as well, and we put that specifically in the contract, then Denver is a third party beneficiary and he has a, 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 a right to um, to make sure that that contract is fulfilled as well under circumstances that are um, are very uh, similar to the circumstances of third party beneficiary um, uh, in the, the case that we brought in Visio. Could you give some like common everyday situations that arise where third party beneficiaries have been found to be able to enforce contract? Like what's something we'd all be familiar with outside of the context of copyright law where this comes up? Um, insurance. Yeah, insurance. Law. Insurance policies are a good example of that. Um, other kinds of family kinds of ar arrangements where you're um, you're making arrangements for sometimes that a child will get some kind of benefit if you go forward. Um, so it, it appears in a variety of different circumstances. Um, did, I, don't, I don't know if that answered your question about, we're dancing a little bit because some of these issues are complicated and we're in an active litigation over it. So I'm sort of like we're, I, it's funny because I, I teach copyright to law students. So it's funny to be like, oh, how do I present it for this, uh, this group? But did, did that? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay. Yes. So generally, SFC has publicized that it has a mode that you want to bring people into compliance. You come into compliance, you're going to lay off. You know, it's a, you know, it, you, they are complying. Maybe there's a settlement to pay your costs, but you're not like really going out as you know another entity in the IP world like a troll would, saying, "Yeah, I'm going to get payday out of this." That's not what the SFC is about. But this is a really important legal theory that you're trying to bring to the map here. So if Visio were to decide tomorrow, hey, here's all our source code, here's the keys, here's everything, have a way, would you just say, okay, good, we're going home? Yeah, so um, our, um, our every, all of the enforcement that we do, and thank you, Ria, for mentioning this, we have committed to principles of community-oriented GPL enforcement. And so we really sat down together and thought hard about, like, you know, we're not just out there to give companies a hard time. We really are out there to increase compliance across the board and, um, and, and create a situation where companies feel like they can participate and contribute. We always say that today's violator is tomorrow's contributor, right? So we, we, those, that's the nature of, and our mandate, such as we have it, is basically from all of you, from 
those of you who contribute to us and who are sustainers of Software Freedom Conservancy and part of the community. And so we want to make sure that we take that mandate very seriously and that we only bring enforcement actions when we feel really confident that they're forwarding the ethical cause of software freedom. And so we take that super, super seriously. And you can take a look at the principles on our websites. We publish them so everyone can see. And in it, we say that litigation is a last resort. We are not interested in jumping straight to lawsuits. I will say that in the time that we have had the principles, that, um, that since we've published them, that companies have really taken advantage of them and they have pushed us as far as we can be pushed, um, basically introducing delay and then pointing to our principles um, and accusing us of being unethical and violating them if at any point we're like, no, 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 this is the time you really have to um, follow the license. But another interesting piece of the Vizio litigation is that um, not only are we seeking a third party beneficiary claim, um, as Ria um, was alluding to, the, the remedy that we're seeking is specific performance. And that's another legal theory, specific performance, specific performance. Yeah, which is a, um, a, a, it, an idea that instead of getting a monetary reward, that in fact money doesn't represent the harm that has occurred here. And so even if we got some amount of money, we wouldn't be made whole, it wouldn't be made right. And so in the law, there's this idea of specific performance where under uh, you know, a contract you can get the party to do what they would have had to have done under the contract. And that is what we are seeking in the Vizio case. So we are seeking the complete and corresponding source code. And we are not seeking um, you know, monetary damages because what we need is our software rights with respect to the TVs that we purchased. Not, you know, we're not out there trying to shake anybody down for money. I don't know if anyone has been talking a lot. Well, so hypothetically, <laughs> the, the question I had is hypothetically, if they met All of our code, going back X number of years, it's all yours. We're publishing it on the internet. We really expected that they would come into compliance pretty quick. And here we are. Wow. Companies don't want to give users their rights. That's what we've discovered in doing this work. They, they, will, they will go to great contortions to not follow the GPL. And that's something that changed uh, in the tw 25 or 30 years I've been doing this. Uh, earlier on, I used to do but people can find talk records of me saying, it's, oh, it's usually a misunderstanding when somebody violates the GPL. The company really just didn't understand it. We educated them. They came into compliance. That was true in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, eventually, companies got wise that they could rip off the community, treat us badly, and just not care what happens to the average consumer. And now no one wants to do what the GPL says. And it's a very hard job we have. And in this instance, we did do have enforcement where we, we did have an enforcement discussions with Vizio um, uh, many years ago, and then they were out of compliance um, years yeah. later. Without a, the prices got even worse. They got even worse. Yeah, um, I thought Stephen's hand was up before. Um, is it not true that in some cases the companies are out of compliance effectively because they've received non-compliant software from another vendor? and they don't even have the source code themselves to provide to the to the end user even if they want to? I mean, I know, I know that doesn't change what they're legally required to do, but is that not part of the problem separate from the... Well, we, we do believe that many companies who distribute software under the GPL are themselves victims of GPL violations. Yes, um, that is, they may have uh, purchased some software or some um, some hardware containing software from some other party uh, that they've then distributed on to uh, uh, end users, so to speak. Um, and, and then when they received that from them, they did not receive the source code or uh, perhaps even an offer for that source code. Um, and so, so yeah, we're, we're very sympathetic to that situation. Um, we would definitely like to help companies that are in that bind. Um, uh, you know, it is helpful if they tell us, if they provide the details of uh, any violation that may have occurred um, against uh, you, you know that they are a victim of in this situation, um, but yes, you're right. Um, there, there are are um, victims of GPL violations at, at a lot of levels. Uh, it's not just people who are uh, receiving the um, buying things from the store, so to speak. But, but if you look at it from our perspective, this is a very difficult situation to have. I'm going to propose a hypothetical. So imagine I find you, Stephen, violating the GPL. 
and I come to you and I say, you distribute this binary, it clearly has, it's clearly based on, on GNU Bash or whatever it is, Linux, anything. It's, it's in the binary, you gave me no source or offer. Where's, where's, the, where's the complete corresponding source code? And you say, man, Denver gave me that binary. I, you know, and, and I, I, don't, I don't know. And I say, okay, well, go ask Denver the source. I, you know, I don't really want to bother Denver. I, you know, he's busy. I, 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 can we just sort this out some way? Well, I say, we can sort it out if you just give the complete corresponding source code that you require in the GPL to give me. Like, well, I don't have it. I got it from Denver. Well, can you ask Denver? No, well, I don't want to bother. Well, I'll maybe ask Denver once next week real quick. And Denver- Maybe he'll charge me more money, so yeah, I, I, I don't want to- I don't know. And then, uh, and then you, you, you go and you finally ask Denver. And then you come back and say, ask Denver. He said, no. <laughs> so, and I say, well, where's the source code? Well, I don't have it because Denver didn't give it to me. And then I say, okay, look, you're, sounds like you're a victim of a GPL violation too. I feel bad for you. Will you just write in an email to me that says, when I got the binary from Denver, he refused to give me the complete corresponding source code? Oh, no, I can't do that. I might hurt my relationship with Denver. <laughs> right? And so what am I supposed to do in that situation exactly? What, what, like, 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 in the end, yes, I agree with you. It's Denver's fault. Sorry, Denver. I turned to <laughs> But if no one is going to require Denver, um, and no one's willing to say, even say Denver did this in writing, <laughs> how, can, how can we prove Denver did it? So what did they say in writing? What then? I, I've never had that experience. <laughs> but, uh, what you He's never had the experience of, I'm just in for the recording. Actually, yeah. He's never had the experience of anybody actually doing that in right. writing. No one, no one has ever written that Denver violated GPL, as it turns out. <laughs> there are other reasons for that. Um. <laughs> So um, about your specific performance, for, for many years I've used uh, uh, BusyBox, Linksys, Westinghouse TV to strike fear into the hearts of my clients and employers, which has allowed me to develop a very healthy level of compliance diligence and keep my clients and, and, and employers very, uh, 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 with, a, with a clean bill of health as far as compliance generally goes. If we're looking at specific performance as being uh, what you're going after, I, I'm not seeing how I'm going to be able to use that if you win the case to strike fear into the hearts of my employers because then the argument comes, well, we can do what you say, Paul, and that's going to be expensive, or we can try to get away with what we've been doing until they catch us and then we'll start doing what you tell us. And, um, and that's what I fear if we don't have the billion dollar damage lawsuits that I can point to and say, you better do what I say, otherwise Bradley's gonna knock on your door. Um, and and I'm, I'm kind of afraid of that situation. How, how would you expect us to respond? What are you expecting to gain by a specific performance lawsuit? And that? how can I use yeah. it? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we, we expect to gain the complete corresponding source code for all GPL and GPL <laughs> programs uh, in, the, in the device and the accused products, right? That's what we expect to gain. Um, as far as your general question, nothing, it, it's only added a new approach, right? It hasn't removed the old approaches. Um, you'll, fi you'll find, I can speak to this because it's in Vizio's filings. If you read the filings, Vizio continues to argue that it's some sort of either or decision, that it either, either the GPL has to be a copyright claim or it has to be a third party beneficiary claim. And as Vizio would say, by the way, it can't be third party beneficiary. We disagree with them about that. But it, it's never been an either or proposition. Uh, as we say in our filings, the person who files the complaints decide what what's goes into the court complaint. <laughs> Um, and that can be a copyright claim, that could be a contract claim, that could be a third party beneficiary claim, it could be a combination of all of them. So all the same incentives that, that it sounds like you were using successfully to convince employers to comply with the GPL, all should still be there. There's just now a few more. Yeah, and I mean, in this instance, any, it, it, the, the, what, what would be very exciting about this is that it really stands for the proposition that consumers should be taken seriously when they make their requests for source code. And currently, quite a number of companies are just ignoring those requests systematically because they think there can never be any kind of um, uh, consequences for doing so. And in this instance, what's so great about this, um, the way that this lawsuit is architected, is that all they have to do is comply, which they are supposed to do anyway, right? 
So if they can't comply, then they really should be thinking twice about the software they're using. They should be able to comply and anyone should be able to ask for it. And it's, you know, the risk is you're only at risk if you aren't doing what you're supposed to do. Um, okay. It feels like, I mean, I know another problem you've had historically is finding legitimate easy to demonstrate copyright holders for some of this stuff where there's GPL violations who are willing to be plaintiffs in a lawsuit. And this also feels like partly a way you can work around that. You can bring complaints on behalf of consumers rather than on behalf of the authors of the software um, in cases where that's hard to determine or hard to find some legal stand up. Is that accurate? Well, I think the, I mean, the, so the question was generally about, um, uh, you know, sometimes copyright holders don't want to step up, um, and so um, it, is this a, a way to help with that? And I think, I think in general, you know, we would like to be able to um, have users be able to do enforcement on on any uh, work under a copyleft license, and so that's part of what uh, this case is about: is to uh, is to show that people do have that right, and that that you don't have to go to uh, every single one of the thousands of copyright holders in the thousands of uh, copylefted programs out there um, in order to be able to enforce um, the, those licenses. Um, that the users who are receiving uh, the products uh, containing software under these licenses uh, can do that work. And so um, hopefully that also um, goes to the earlier point about um, how much companies feel they have to comply because uh, the concern is not just the some few copyright holders that might care. It is all of these uh, millions of, of consumers um, or, or end users, people who have received uh, products that they purchased um, who, who want the rights that they are guaranteed uh, under the agreements. Yeah. I would recommend for people to read the, the ruling in the, in the remand. So Vizio tried to remove the case from state court to federal court, basically saying that um, you know we were bringing this third party beneficiary case, it was preempted by copyright. And by the way, it should be thrown out because we didn't assert our copyrights. So uh, that was the, the, the theory there. And the judge, when um, she remanded it back to state court, she gave a really um, a few lines about um, the, the nature of consumers basically having that, that information and those, the, those interests being aligned. Yeah, and I think to, to, to your point, Bart, about uh, the question of individual copyright holders not wanting to be litig litigation, what I find in my 30 years of talking to these copyright holders is a, a relatively legitimate feeling if I gave at the office, right? The, if you find somebody who went through the effort to make sure they, their employer didn't steal their copyright from them, by the way, most employers steal their copyrights from developers because almost everybody who's employed at a work for hire arrangement, your company is stealing your copyrights from you and you should demand when you take that job, let them keep your own copyrights, at least in the open source and free software. I wouldn't phrase but, it as stealing, but I would say that they are they are sold very cheaply. I'm not a lawyer, so I can say stealing. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be mistaken as SOC's yeah, position. That doesn't tricky, make any they're, sense. They're, There's an agreement where people specify, read your employment agreements, people, and negotiate them. I, there, but it's, it's, it's explicitly said. So saying yeah, that will, is steal is I saying... I will revise like, the word steal and say they are, tr they are often tricking people into giving up their copyrights. <laughs> what they do is they, they, they tell you they'll promise to let you contribute to open source software, but they don't really make it clear that they're going to get all the copyrights to that open source software, which means they can actually renege that agreement any time because they have the right to change the license on the copyrights and you don't. Um, so, But having met many people who have gone through the effort of making sure their employer didn't get their copyrights and they licensed under a good, strong, good copyleft license and they spent decades of their lives contributing to this project and then I come to them and say, now join us as a plaintiff in this lawsuit. They're like, man, I gave it the office, right? I mean, come on, what more do you want from me? Um, so we have a couple of solutions. This one is, um, Software Freedom Conservancy accepts uh, copyright assignment uh, on basically any, any copyleft at work at all. You can go right to our website. It's a single form. You can click and describe what the work is and assign the copyright to us. And we'll take the charge of doing any copyright enforcement for you. And the second thing we're doing is the third party beneficiary claims to make sure that the people whose rights are supposed to be upheld, which is the user, which is also all the future developers, uh, who are going to get a device and install it. Almost everyone who works on 
operating system software under the GPL today got their start because they had to write to copy, modify, redistribute, and reinstall their copy of Linux when they got started, and they could play with the code and do something with it. Almost everyone today who gets a copy of Linux does not have the right to copy, share, modify, redistribute, or reinstall that software. Almost every child who gets a copy of Linux can't do that with the copy of Linux they get. And that is a travesty and a disaster. Is there... No, uh, somebody had a, a hand up before, yeah. but I did call on you, so I'm sorry. But we, yeah, let's go. Do them first, please. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, Video's ownership recently changed. And I was wondering if the new owners were more or less, was it possibly less friendly? It would be Walmart. <laughs> um, yeah, it, I, I mean, I, I don't follow these things super closely, but my understanding is the deal isn't close. Um, but there is, um, so the question was just about Physio potentially having a new owner. And uh, yes, they announced they uh, uh, may be acquired by Walmart, but I think it hasn't closed. But uh, I, yeah. Yeah, I want to pick up on something that Bradley said, which is that enforcing these licenses is so much work and it is so exhausting. And uh, as you all know, this Visio case has been outstanding for years now. We have been working on it. And so when we talk about copyright holders not wanting to become plaintiffs, it's because it's basically, it's more than a full-time job to do any of this. I mean, we are a really tiny staff and it's more than we have the capacity to do. We work as hard as we can and it is exhausting, like truly, truly, truly exhausting and wildly expensive. And so kind of doing it like a nonprofit as we are and trying to represent consumer interests as a whole is the only way that I think it could ever possibly be accomplished because it's the only way we can pull these resources and the only way we can get it done. Uh, yeah, just as, as an example, um, uh, as, of, as of this month, it has been uh, six years since uh, I sent the first letter to Visio saying, hey, could you uh, please give us the source code? Um, and so, uh, so yeah, it's a long time and I can see how a lot of people don't, wouldn't want to be involved in something for that long. Um, and then, uh, you know, we worked with them for, uh, many months and years after that and filed suit in 2021. So, you know, we're not quick to, um, you know, say, oh, well, you didn't reply. We're filing a lawsuit tomorrow. Um, so, so yeah, just as an example of, you know, how, how much we, um, try to get these things resolved and, and how long it can take and why it's important that uh, we be able to um, enforce as a third party beneficiary. So the last thing at this point I want to add is uh, Harald Velta, who did a tremendous amount of work in Germany uh, bringing copyright cases, he more or less put his technical career on hold to do that work. Uh, he focused on the enforcement rather than doing the new software development he wanted to do. Um, and that's why he doesn't do it anymore, because he's focused on being a software developer again, not doing GPL enforcement. Uh, and yeah, he's a very excellent copy elected software developer, and the world should have him doing that, not having to be a plaintiff all the time. Um, Call somebody else. Oh, go ahead. I'm not keeping it clear. Is there any transferability of um, results of legal cases across countries? Like if somebody wins in Europe, can you use that? So, so this, it's an interesting question. Courts do sometimes look at other jurisdictions to see how decisions came out. So there can be there can be influence from place to place, but generally it's the law of the country and the even the um, the jurisdiction of where the case is. So, for example, um, uh, you know we we brought the Vizio case in uh, in state court in California. So that it's limited to that um, that state, and then um, it you know courts do look to decisions in comparably situated places. And sometimes that means that, um, you know, states influence each other and circuits and, um, and eventually you can have appeals within the United States that have more wide reaching impact. Um, but, uh, but usually it's in place by place. And I do wanna say, I, it's terrible that this is a teaser, but I do have to say that we do have some news coming out from our work in Germany soon that uh, we haven't been able to talk about before, but we have some likely really good news to share and and and, and we're and and we, we talk mostly about the Vizio case because it's the thing that, that uh, Conservancy is doing specifically as a plaintiff but we've continued uh, those of you that read our 990s carefully which you all should <laughs> um, we'll see that we've done uh, some amount of grant making around the world uh, to do GPL enforcement as well 
Um, and the, the case that Karen's talking about is one of those cases where we've been doing a regular grant making uh, in Germany to help a uh, plaintiff there uh, bring, uh, bring a case that we'll, we'll soon be making an announcement about. Yeah. Uh, so, out of curiosity, if you do say win the Vizio case, do you at least get like reimbursed for your legal fees or time or anything? Or try to cover this. Sure. No. We we made a demand in the complaint for attorneys' fees. Um, they it will be up to the court to decide whether to grant those after the courts decided the other uh, the other uh, issues, the third party beneficiary, and then the specific performance. Um, we did make a decision to, uh, to un uh, most, most, uh, when I proposed this talk, we, we thought we'd be at the end of trial because the trial was originally scheduled for last week. Everybody can see that in the scheduling order. Um, you can also see in the scheduling order that it was uncalendared. Uh, we did that. Uh, somewhat to Ria's question earlier, uh, it's not a, dire a direct answer, but I think it will, will <laughs> take you somewhere, that we, we try to give everybody every last opportunity to do the right thing. And we made a decision uh, even though we're extremely frustrated at the length of the case, we're, we're frankly quite angry at Vizio at their constant effort to try to get it removed to federal court. They've, they've tried that so many different ways that it's very frustrating. Nonetheless, we made a decision that we would um, uncalendar the trial, and we, last week we did a confidential mediation with Vizio, uh, and we're continuing those settlement discussions in hopes that Vizio uh, can comply with the GPL, and we hold out hope for that. And we will recalendar the trial if we cannot. So. Just to be clear, the it's not confidential that we had a mediation. It's yes, just the, 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 the concept that I was trying to head off the, the what did you talk about in the mediation? Which is the next question everyone's going to ask. The mediation, the, what we talked about in the mediation was confidential. So. so a lot of these companies uh, obviously kind of assume like our lawyers are bigger than yours and we can go until you're bankrupt or you have to put your efforts elsewhere. Uh, you know, like uh, for, even for a, a purpose-built organization like this, let alone individual contributors, uh, what, like are there any kinds of protections in, in law, like in the US or around the world for basically that kind of disparity of resources? You know that would that would favor uh, somebody bringing an infringement lawsuit against a big company. Uh, so um, I, just to um, summarize the question. Um, at, um, it sounds like what you're asking is um, given that uh, uh, lawyers and lawsuits can be very expensive. Are there um, other other strategies or avenues or different places where it, it might be different in some ways? Um, yeah. There are either like ways ways to even the playing field more or less, or, or ways to say, you know, for a judge to say, it's clear the company is trying to drag this out, you know, and so we're going to impose penalties on them for not, you know, taking this quickly or responsibly or making spurious arguments. I think what I, I have a pithy answer. <laughs> which is unfortunately the GPL is drafted does not solve the global problem of the inherent inequity and unfairness of capitalism. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Uh, we're trying our best in, in, a, in a flawed system to get adjudicated. And I, I, well, I, I just wanted to mention that, uh, you know, in observing different cases that have gone on around the world, uh, it's clear to me that in some jurisdictions, uh, it, it is quite inexpensive to do these these lawsuits. Um, and so I'm happy to see that people are are doing these lawsuits in such jurisdictions. And um, um, yeah, I, I hope that there's more more knowledge and stuff uh, of that generally. But uh, that that's my my short answer. Did you want to? I have more, but I don't know. Okay. We're at the end of this session. Uh, I think we have, we have a few more, a few more minutes. More minutes. What, is the, what is now the break set to? What, I think we were bumped 30 minutes total. Um, I think. Does that sound right? Anyway. 15 minutes. Just 15 total? So it's, it's actually your decision. Though. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, we, well, we go a little into um, then. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. So Go ahead. I, I have I have definitive fifteen oh five. So we have four minutes left. Okay. Go ahead, Veg. If all we are asking in the case is specific performance, so well, and and attorneys' fees, but. But the main thrust of the case is specific. So uh, 
I would say generally when you bring a case like this, and um, and our other announcement will reflect this, party compliance and provides complete and corresponding source code, well, then the case is moot, right? And that is, but that, that is all we are looking for is for, is to achieve compliance. So it would be challenging to continue the case, um, but there are a lot of um, subtle details that I can't really discuss right now. Um, yeah. I was going Go to answer that question, um, and Karen, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with this, but lots of lawyers offer pro bono time. We'll give, we'll waive legal for cases on partly because they're interested or to make a name for themselves, and they'll do stuff pro bono so you can get access to legal talent even if you're not a mega corporation. So Rhea's saying that in the answer of how do we leave it even the playing field, um, are some lawyers that will give pro bono legal assistance, and we do have some pro bono lawyers that have SFC. Um, but the amount of uh, work that comes into litigation makes it very, very difficult to get pro bono lawyers to take a litigation from the beginning to the end. Um, it is just so expensive, and it takes so much time. Um, we are able to get pro bono lawyers because we are a charitable organization, and we can put a really give a good explanation of what we're trying to achieve. Uh, but at the end of the day, a lot of these lawyers are working for law firms, and they the, there's a limit to how much pro bono work they can do. And when it's three complete months of doing nothing but work that's pro bono, that's very difficult. I was going to mention the CASE Act also because there's like a small claims court in copyright now um, in the United States that has some interesting um, uh, possibilities, but it doesn't really, it, it, those are for monetary amounts. Um, but so there's, there are things that is in the law, but none of them are as effective. A loss in there just so, so expensive. If you are not a sustainer of the Software Freedom Conservancy, please consider donating to us. Um, the, uh, our, it is so expensive to do this work. It takes us so much time. One of the things that we do in addition to um, when we help plaintiffs bring their own lawsuits is not only do we make grants, but we also provide some technical support because it's just so, so, so much work. Yeah, and I, I, think, I think the bigger problem there is that the, the we, we uh, we, we reached the situation where these uh, companies, the com companies that incorporate Linux, uh, specifically uh, just to pick one area of GPL work uh, into products, have become so entrenched. Uh, they will not comply, generally speaking. And they, when we negotiate them before litigation, they take a fine sue us attitude. Like, you, you, think, you think we have to do that? We don't think so. Just you'll have to sue us. And they band together. So we have seen dossiers, you know, emails that are that we get from different companies that are the same email that clearly have been shared amongst these companies as they like put their backs together and try to create sometimes a fictitious um, painting of um, of uh, of things that have been said, and you know, so it's it's very very frustrating. And you know, we've heard from employees and companies who probably telling us that there are meetings internally where competitors are meeting together to discuss the threat of a lawsuit for GPL compliance. And just to put a fine point on that, I, I, um, about, about <laughs> six or seven years ago, um, I, I gave a talk about GPL enforcement at one of these big trade association corporate conferences. Um, and this uh, person runs by, runs by me in the hallway after my talk, shoves a piece of paper in my hand and keeps running. And it was a list of product numbers from their company that they knew were out of compliance. I mean, I mean, basically, we're at the point where, where whistleblowers are afraid to blow the whistle on their company just violating the GPL. I think we have time for one more question. We're clear. Um, be at 15, so like oh, at 15 now. You can wrap up in five okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, go ahead. Um, so, can we start getting into Rico territory now? Like, are you friends of trade or? Um, I, I, I have a lot of theories, but I, I'm not a lawyer. Well, as we said earlier, we, if, if anybody has a novel legal theory, we are curious to hear it. We are exploring quite a lot. So, yeah, I, um, I, I, and, and yeah, I think that I can say is that we, one of the things we have, I mean, the, the way the third party beneficiary suit came about was just uh, regular, ongoing, over a period of years, calls with attorneys uh, to talk about what methods were available to us. Um, in the law to adjudicate the rights of users. And with our attorneys, we're, we were able to come up that this theory was, was an excellent theory. 
and and deserved uh, to be tried because it's it's in many ways better than the copyright theory. I would say that this theory was actually suggested quite early in the history of oh, copy true. left. Like this is not something that is like a totally new idea, but the uh, but that uh, that idea got shouted down in part because of the corporate interests. Um, at stake. And That's so uh, then there became kind of like a group think amongst lawyers in this space um, uh, about some of the, 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 the ways that this could be addressed. And what has been fascinating is that every time, like every few years, somebody new would come in the space and say, what about third party beneficiary? Isn't that the, isn't that the way? And eventually it was like, oh. Yeah. And, and right. In, and the funny part was when I, when I first started to look into this, I was talking about quoting a text of the GPL right in the middle of the GPL. You must make an offer valid to all third parties <laughs> to provide. The third party beneficiary was baked right into the GPL from the start. It's just very, very clear. Um, and so, you know, I, and I, I, I think that, uh, that, that, and it's very clear and it was suggested very early on. Oh, just, yeah, by the text of E2, I guess is when it was first suggested. <laughs> yeah, but no lawyers in, yeah. in the field True. were suggesting that that was the way it, it, it was most obviously handled. Yeah. Yeah. In the green. Um, so, question about uh, jurisdiction. Um, so, you mentioned uh, filing cases in state courts. Um, are there particular features of um, state law that make one jurisdiction more attractive to file in than another? I think, so the question is, um, are there certain characteristics of different state courts that make one better to file in than another? And I think in general, that's probably true. Um, I can't, I, I don't know about any specifics myself. I haven't, haven't researched it, but yeah, I think that's generally true. But you should certainly follow up with us to talk about that more if you want to dig into it. Yeah, laws do vary state to state, and there are advantages and disadvantages. And we've done a bunch of research on, obviously, with connection with the suits that we bring. Um, you know, the decision, state court made a lot of sense for the Vizio uh, case because of the way that the whole suit was architected and um, also their location, and uh, I, I can't say more, yeah, actually. Yeah, I mean, I cannot say any more than I just said, so. Um, uh, well, I do want to, before we have like two minutes left, I just wanted to mention, uh, the one thing we didn't get to, another thing we did this year uh, is uh, we, we spent a, a, a lot of time working with regard to the Neo4j case. Um, so this was a case, uh, PureThink versus Neo, or, or Neo4j versus PureThink, uh, where um, th there was a government contract uh, regarding a code base that was under the Afero GPL, and uh, the small contractor who had deployed the AGPL uh, solution uh, basically got into a dispute with the company that was pr doing proprietary license, so selling a non-AGPL license. Um, and this litigation has had a number of unfortunate uh, twists and turns. Um, it, recently, uh, the final decision for that came out, um, and, uh, and the individual who just runs a small business uh, was faced with a very large fine, which is very unfortunate. Um, but there's a lot on our website that you might want to read about that. The big concern of what happened in that case was regarding a very specific clause in Afero GPL v3 that allows downstream users to remove additional restrictions that uh, people place on the license itself. And this company, in fact, had done that. And this uh, individual who ran a small business removed it uh, in his incorporation of the software uh, as part of the government contract. And, uh, and they were unfortunately able to get damages against him for it. So this is a really unfortunate outcome. It fortunately is not pre precedential uh, because it's just in the court of, uh, as, as the Europeans say, court of first instance. Um, I, uh, what do you call it in the US? What's the equivalent of that? Court of first instance? Okay. Yeah, same thing in the US. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that's, that's at least fortunate. But, it's worth reading up on this case. This is a classic example where uh, companies are litigating about the GPL. It's, it's very interesting that SFC is criticized and Howard Belton was criticized for bringing cases uh, as, as individuals or as nonprofit charities, but companies are litigating about the GPL all the time. And there's actually multiple precedents about the GPL that were from disputes between two for-profit companies, um, some of which we actually cite in some of our filings uh, in Visio. Uh, but but it but one of our one of the impetuses for us in deciding that we have to move forward is that do we want the litigation brought as a public policy issue uh, for the benefit of users and for the public good as we're a public charity, 
Or do, are we going to let everything about the GPL be dis decided by disputes between big corporations? Uh, and I don't really trust either side of big corporations suing each other to come with the right outcome for a GPL case. Uh, so as part of that, I just wanted to wrap up quickly here by mentioning uh, that one of the projects we've been working on over the past year uh, is use the source. Um, and I'll be talking about that starting in uh, five minutes, it looks like. Um, and so uh, so feel free to stick around. I'll be uh, announcing a new feature of use the source that has not been uh, public before. So um, yeah, uh, stick around. Yeah, thanks a lot, everybody. We appreciate your patience with the AV issues and everything. Thank you. Uh,